When we talk about how to think like an architect, what we really are talking about is the process of thinking in a structured way. Architects need to be able to think like this, because buildings can be incredibly complex to design. There are many components to consider when designing a building, each with its own unique set of challenges. For instance, architects need to figure out what the client brief is, we need to know what the building regulations and construction law is, we also need to have a common sense understanding of construction process and how to put things together. And on top of that, we also need to be super clear in our communication with other people involved in design and construction process. Each of these different areas will have their own challenges. To try to solve them all at once is a bit like trying to solve a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle in 10 minutes. Maybe it's doable, but most likely no sane person is able to. Therefore, we need a sequential step-by-step -step approach to architectural design process and for that we need an ability to think in a structured way. Of course, there's a whole other dimension to architecture besides the practicalities of the built environment. A good architect in essence should also be a great artist. Why? Well, if all we do is follow the linear process mechanically, then we may as well end up with the most optimal solution, but we won't create great architecture. If we follow a strict process, we'll inevitably lose an opportunity to push the boundaries of imagination which is required to create truly memorable and delightful spaces. But the artistic element in architectural design is also subject to the same structured way of thinking. You see, creativity too needs a framework to be useful. This is because architecture is an applied art form. It is rooted in the constraints of the real world. If we go about designing buildings without any constraints, we will essentially be shooting from a hip in an attempt to design meaningful and useful architecture. So therein lies the thesis of this video, which is that I believe that in order to think like an architect, one must be thinking in terms of the process. Or to put it into another way, an architect is only as good as his design process. So what is involved in design process? So the first step in any design process is the research. Research is about gathering relevant data that may be useful in our design. And research is also about discarding the irrelevant information that may lead us astray. A good research is the one that becomes progressively more clear in gathering all the useful information, whilst at the same time eliminating all the useless fluff. There are three different research areas that architects can explore to inform design. The first one is the empirical research, which involves measurement of the physical context, pragmatic client brief considerations, environmental impact, available budget and potential size of the building. The second category is the research of intangible aspects. It is the type of research that has a scope for interpretation. Intangible research includes cultural, political or religious context of the place in which we design our building. A lot of these elements must be learned and experienced and they're hard to quantify or measure. Lastly, we have the aspirational research, which involves architects looking up for inspiration from other buildings, works of art, designs, books, or anything that can trigger imagination and inspiration. In fact, anything can serve as an aspirational research as long as we apply the filter of usefulness to it so that we don't get lost in the rabbit holes of Google search. Besides getting inspired from others' work, in aspirational type of research, we can draw an inspiration from our own intuitive drawings, modeling, or writing. In aspirational research, we can also use the previous iterations and discarded design options to drive the process forward. The point of research in architecture is to open up our eyes to possibilities and get inspired. It is also a great way to get insight and understanding of other people's cultures and their way of life. Research can also give a glimpse into different ways of tackling problems and look at the problems as opportunities. However, the research alone won't lead us to a great architecture. We can't just rely on absorbing and digesting research to come up with design. What we need is the purpose behind our design. This is where vision comes in. Vision is about big picture thinking, it's about forming an agenda for the project and it's about forming aspirations. Any architectural project comes with endless possibilities of how to approach design. A single brief given to two different architects is likely to lead to completely different outcomes because each architect will have slightly different agenda and the purpose that will influence their design approach. And this is a good thing because it means that there is no single right way to design. But however, there is a difference between an exciting and expiring design versus a boring execution. A well-defined project vision will have a significant impact on the quality of the design. Having a vision for the project will mean having a guiding force through design process. At the very beginning, we may not have a clear brief, we may not have a developed concept, we might not even have a site to design on. Therefore, the purpose of vision is to also give a sense of direction at the very start of the project until the end. A vision can give us energy and help us to ride the waves of uncertainties 
and difficulties during design process, technical stages and construction. So how do we go about developing vision? The best way in my experience is through developing a narrative or a story of the building. Sure, at the very start of the process we won't have the full picture of what our building is supposed to be, but we can start piecing its story together. We can describe the aspiration, the purpose, the goals and the context in which the building is located before we put pen to paper. Before we develop narrative, it may be useful to ask several kinds of questions like What is the reason for the project to exist? What impact will it create? Who will be the ideal user? and how will it improve their experience. Having a vision and compiling a research at the same time is a strong position to have because this gives the project a clear parameters to follow, a type of roadmap or a compass to navigate towards the right solution. But in order to make our roadmap or our compass useful, we need to actually start moving towards our destination. And in architecture, in order to move towards design solution, we need to get creative. Creativity fuels many of architectural activities. It is through creativity that anything and everything is possible. Creativity draws inspiration from research and vision, but it's mainly driven by the act of making. This making can involve modeling, drawing, 3D modeling, drafting, painting, sculpting, and writing. The point is to get the ideas out of the head and into the tangible world. Creativity is about putting ideas out there. The process of making will take up a significant portion of design process. The reason for this is quite simple, which is that unless you're a design genius, it will take a good few iterations to get from bad design to mediocre design and from mediocre design to good design and great design. And it is hard to measure how long this process of improvement takes because it depends on different factors like complexity of the brief, individual skill set and talent, specific constraints. But one thing is certain, the more we create, the better design solution becomes. However, design process is not linear. It's not merely enough to pour hours upon hours of work into iterating an idea. Sometimes scrapping idea that doesn't work and starting from scratch is required. This may be true when there is a misalignment between what we are created and our vision and the brief, Sometimes we'll need to scrap ideas because we'll have new information that will make the previous assumptions invalid. And in other times we might just realize that our work is not up to the scratch. Accepting the creative process is unpredictable is a skill and an attitude that each architect should embrace. Scrapping old ideas in favor for new ones is a second nature to good architects. An important point to bear in mind with all above being said is that creativity should not be confused with critiquing. There are two different things that unfortunately tangle together. The distinction should be drawn between creativity, the making part, and critiquing, the editorial part of the creative process that follows creation. We should aim to create first and judge later, but many architects fall victims of their own judgment and critique. Architects in attempt to improve will make harsh judgments about their design well before it's required. This problem has many labels, perfectionism, fear, lack of creativity, and others. But the rule of thumb should be really that we should aim to create first and judge later, the next day preferably. It is far more important to keep creating rather than being stuck in over-analysis mode. Creativity might be the most exciting part of architecture and it is why a lot of people are drawn to architecture. But buildings are large and expensive structures that require cooperations of many people and vast resources to build them. There is a lot of complexity involved in construction and because of that architects have developed a convention to make sure that buildings and constructions are more streamlined and easier for everyone to follow. This is why every building has walls, doors, windows, roofs, floors and ceilings. A bit like in literature, words, paragraphs and chapters make up the building blocks for author to write a novel, architectural elements help architects to create space. Convention is also about standardization of documentation and drawings for clarity. Convention can range from having the same measurement system, the same scale types, the same orthographic projections like plans, sections and elevations, naming conventions, drawing conventions, construction methods, cost estimates and legal contracts. All of these are there to basically reduce the number of errors and to make the whole thing easier to understand. For example, when we employ a contractor, there are certain things that they will expect from architect. On architectural drawings, for example, they will need to see the scale, orientation, dimensions, name tags, descriptions and specification references on each and every drawing. Likewise, clients will expect to have doors, windows, rooms, toilet facilities, etc. to be able to use the building. So convention is really about making sure that the basic expectations are met and that the relevant information is conveyed at the every stage of the process. Convention is also about communication skills with everyone involved in the process. 
When we talk with clients, architects need to be reassuring in their leadership. With contractors, architects need to be clear and concise, precise, and also friendly in their attitude. Because there are so many people involved in the process, we need conventions so that nothing is lost in translating the building from paper to construction site. In other words, architectural convention is required so that the project can be seen through and delivered. Okay, now we touched on the main points, let's talk about the next step, the reflection. No project is perfect and no project is likely to ever be. But architects can always aim to make the next project better than the last one. Making mistakes and learning from them is basically a reflection process which is about growth and development. It's about thinking hard about what is done right, what can be improved and what should be added or omitted. Reflection is a continuous process at any stage of design process. It's a skill that is almost like a safety net or a common sense check that should be at the back of our minds. Having no reflection skills in architecture is a bit like driving without brakes, it's not very wise. So, for example, we might start a project with assumption that the given building should be positioned in a certain way to serve a specific portion of the area. The reflection process can help us to check if this move is the right one to make, given the circumstances. And it can help us to assess other options. For example, if we were to open up the building to serve more people, would that create a better accessibility opportunity? Or should we close off the access instead? to reduce the capacity but improve the experience of the main building users. In essence, architecture is about making sure that the best possible design solution is implemented given the specific circumstances. And it's also about making sure that architects don't fool themselves and see the areas that can be improved. So these are the main areas that I believe are involved when we talk about thinking like an architect. It's a path and a process which is non-linear. And many of the covered elements above will overlap. But I do think that although there are things to add to this list, research, vision, creativity, convention and reflection are really the core competencies that are involved in thinking like an architect, without which it's hard to develop the really good design project. If you enjoyed this video, you will also enjoy this other video that I made on how to design a residential house completely from scratch. In this video, I go through forming a concept and planning the space in order to come up with an interesting design solution. So check out that video and I'll see you in the next one.